Hello everyone, hope that you're all alright. It seems like an absolute eternity since we were bringing you a Mansfield Matters podcast, but today we are back. It's a couple of days after we sat down and recorded this episode with Andy White. However, a few little recording hitches with the video means I'm having to do things a different way around. Also, I wanted to come on and sort of give you guys a bit of an update about what's going to be happening over the coming weeks or so. So today, we have got our interview with Andy White, our Stag Stories episode with him. Fantastic couple of stories coming your way over the next hour or so. Now, a couple of things firstly on that particular episode. The first thing is, if you're watching the video version of this, which of course you guys are, one, you've got a different intro, but two, it's slightly shorter than the audio version. Mainly because of the video recording, things weren't quite set up in this brand new office and things which I've got, which allowed me to get the recording right and to share both with you. So if you're an audio listener of this, we're encouraging you um, to, to have a little bit of a listen to that as well. There's some extra content in that audio episode for you um, as well. So make sure you go and check that out. Number two is that uh, in the in weeks uh, we are hoping to host Stag Stories Legends Live 2. Yes, we've got a fantastic guest lined up for you guys, um, which will either be a live in person or event or an online um, paid event for charity. Mind Charity is going to benefit from that and a couple of others along the way as well. More details on that soon. Now, I'm not going to tell you who the guest is for that because I think the feedback for it will be slightly swayed because of it. Um, it's a guy who it's a fantastic sermon. The club has had two spells with us. Um, excellent bit of a goal scorer as well. A real, real legend. I'm going to say no more on that. This person has agreed to do Legends Live 2 with us. However, we want your feedback on how you want to see that. So, are you wanting to watch that in person? Maybe at the club in one of the bars? Are you thinking that you'd like to watch it online, maybe, um, so you can watch it from the comfort of your home, uh, but get a, send a secure link to watch it online and, of course, benefit from the charity? How else would you like to, to help the charity? Of course, in previous years, the last time we did it, we had the mug raffle, other raffles as well, donations on the door, that sort of thing. So we've got four questions for you on a little online survey. All you've got to do um, is go on that. It takes literally a minute to complete. The link for that is in the description, so go and check that out. Once we've got uh, enough feedback on that, we'll announce details and get the ball rolling on Stag Stories Legends Live 2. Also, um, over the next coming weeks or so, we are going to be bringing you some more Stag Stories standalone episodes for free. Some great guests coming up, so stay tuned to our social media for that. At the time of recording this, we are yet to record those episodes, so I won't be telling you who um, are going to be guests in those episodes because I never like to do that before we record them. Once bitten, twice shy with that. Um, but I can assure you that we've got some great guests coming up over the next two or three weeks or so. Uh, I can also tell you that those episodes will be out every single Saturday afternoon um, for you as well. Um, Saturday, 3 p.m. Uh, for the release of those episodes. So make sure um, you are subscribed to us on all good podcast apps, that you are following us on social media, at MTFC Matters on Facebook and on Twitter, um, and that you check out our website, mtfcmatters.co.uk as well. You'll be able to watch those episodes, you'll be able to listen to those episodes as well. Also, finally, before I head into the crux of the episode, we are um, raising money for the Minds charity throughout this series. So we are asking you guys um, to give whatever you can. Yes, we've got the Legends Live event which is coming up, which is going to be our main fundraiser. But if you're unable to attend that or you know you, you can't afford to, uh, to do it at that level, um, not sure what the price and structure will be for that. If you just want to give uh, a pound or whatever, we have got a coffee link set up. All the details in the description and on screen now where you can give anything from £1 upwards. We're going to be leaving that open throughout the entirety of the season and at different points we'll be giving whatever is in that account to charity. So, um, for example, the first time we give some money to the Mind Charity will be at the start of the season. So if you've enjoyed what you've heard or seen in today's episode, then please do donate whatever you can via the link in the description. Right, that's enough talking from me. Um, let's head delve into the episode. Uh, this is Stag Stories with Andy White. 
Cheltenham and us were neck and neck for promotion. I think they were actually favourites for promotion uh, at that stage because I think they were like a point ahead with the game in hand. There must have been 12,000 people at Field Mill that night. It only holds eight. So there were people stood up around the corner flags. The stewards had to get like literally rope out. It was like the old days, like the 70s in terms of people. That was the best atmosphere that I played in at Mansfield, certainly. Murray has now scored six goals in 10 games since joining on loan from Derby County. Yet the arrival of 36-year-old Scott Sellers from Huddersfield might prove to be just as significant. Sellers setting up Andy White, who made it 2-0, his first goal since he scored in a 4-0 win over Macclesfield in August. Just about everybody back for Chesterfield to defend it. The goalkeeper has stayed on his line. It's a Lawrence header. It's a Lawrence goal. It's a Liam Lawrence winner. To be honest, I was panicking because um, my girlfriend was in the mix, standing up behind the goal. The reason I was panicking was because you, you had the option to pay for a, for a seated ticket, but it was an extra pound, so because it was cheaper, I got a standing <laughs> ticket. So I was, I was going, oh my day, she's going to be like, on her own as well, she didn't have any family with No! Her. I don't know what she must have made there, but yeah, for oh, me, I wow. was uh, yeah, panicking. Quid's a quid, isn't it, in the day. <laughs> Right then, Andy, let's delve now into your uh, your stag's journey, your full stag's journey. Um, first and foremost, when was it that you sort of uh, moved to Mansfield Town? Cause you were, it took you a while to sort of break through into the first team setup, but I believe it was sort of mid mid to late 90s, wasn't it, when you got the, got the call to join the club? Uh, yeah, 99, pre-season 99, I was playing for Hucknall Town, um, my PE teacher at the time, took me to Hucknall. Uh, so I was just playing playing with them, really. Not, I think it was probably my first game. It was against Mansfield in a pre-season friendly. And uh, I think it was uh, Stuart Watkins, Skip and Baz came over to me after and said, you know, do you fancy coming coming on trial? Um, I said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come down. <laughs> Not thinking anything of it. I didn't really have aspirations to be a professional footballer. I just, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come. I've, I'm doing my levels so I can only come during school holidays. So... I think it was the summer summer um, summer holidays that I went down, trained with the first team. Um, you know, there was likes of uh, Lee Peacock, um, a few other Tony Lorma, um, Ian Bowling, all the, all the kind of yeah old school Stags players, and, and I really enjoyed it. And then um, after I went back to school in the September, and I lost touch a little bit until the kind of October, November time. And Skip rang me up and said, do you want to come play for the youth team? So I was playing for the youth team. And at that time, we had a really great youth team. So we had, you know, Leah Lawrence, um, Diz, uh, Lee Williamson, uh, Jerv, uh, Dean Mitchell, uh, and uh, Dean Sweeney. So we had a really great team. And I could see the kind of the potential of it. And I was just playing on an evening. We got through to FA Youth Cup, quarterfinals, Midland FA Youth Cup. You know, we're playing at Stag's. On a, on a Tuesday night uh, under the flood light, which I absolutely loved. And it was that time where I just played with no pressure at all because, you know, I was just enjoying my football. Um, and again, still doing my um, A-level, still studying at sixth form. Um, and yeah, so I just kind of joined evenings at weekends. In fact, I still played for Hucknall. I used to play for the youth team on a Saturday morning and then go off and, and um Earned a few more quid playing for Hucknall Town first team in the afternoon, so I was getting like a double bubble on a on a Saturday, which uh, was great because I still had my paper round as well at the time. So I was getting fifty quid a week from paper round. I think I was getting forty quid a week from Mansfield, and then another sixty from Hucknall. So I was a richest student going. Wait, Hucknall were playing more money than what Mansfield were? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know yeah. what? With what we've sort of heard about the ex-chairman, Nate, that doesn't surprise me at all, does it, you? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not surprised they're playing anything, to be fair, but uh, no, there's no surprise there. It, it, did, it did go up to 60 quid because they didn't want me to play for Hulton anymore, so they offered me 60 quid. But all the youth team players at the time, and I don't think they know this, so like Liam Lawrence, Diz, uh, Leroy, um, Jerv, they were earning 45 on a YTS, you know, they're nine to five every day. And I was coming just playing on Saturday and earning 60 quid, so, yeah. Oh, dear. I mean, I imagine that was great banter in the dressing room as well, obviously keeping that hidden. There might have been one or two times where I might have been tempted to sort of 
drop that one out there. But, you know, you, you mentioned so many names there, and we spoke sort of uh, off air before we started recording about one particular name in particular, which was Skip, a.k.a. Stuart Watkiss. Fantastic guest for us, Nath, wasn't he, when we when we spoke to him? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, going we, we we had to travel, didn't we? We haven't we haven't travelled too many. I think it was Mickey Bolden that we travelled to, and then obviously um, Stuart Watkins. So we went all the way to to Cleefort, which was a great day out for us. But most importantly, I mean, he was obviously he was massively accommodating for us. Anyway, Ed wasn't he? Saw us out. Was it a local gym? Yeah, his we... gym, wasn't it? That he he'd uh, pulled some strings honestly... to get us a nice little corner there to set up all our equipment and things like that um but i think that you know off air we, he was very sort of um genuine very sort of uh, helpful and really wanted to to get to, you know to to be involved with uh with, with the podcast and then obviously he had his, his great stories to share along with it and, and then even since then you know with the amount of times we're we're live on facebook and it pops he's up always popping watching, up. watching it's, it's, it's brilliant isn't it he's like number one just, fan yeah, and that, it just, I think that's just the type of guy he is. And I think he must have been um, you know, a, a real good person to, to play football under. I mean, I've genuinely never found, Andy, anybody that's got a bad word to say about Stuart Watkiss. Oh, I mean, yeah, I can't speak hard enough of him. I mean, he gave me my chance, really. Him and Billy, Billy Dearden, uh, Ivan Holly, you know, they were all, all in the kind of youth setup at the time. And I think it's just that, I mean... Skip, he, he, he wears his heart on his sleeve. He expects 100% every, every training session, um, every game. And he brings the players along on that journey with him. And he expects you to run for a brick wall for him, uh, which you end up doing, <laughs> you know, lit quite literally sometimes because we used to play um, like five a side up on the Astro, you know, with the low low boundaries and stuff. And um, we used to call it murder ball. We used to do it on a Friday. And, and it was like really fast, intense football. Tackles are flying in like, you wouldn't believe, you know, people going over the barriers because of you know, that kind of physical challenges. But that's what you expected. So you played with that high intensity, brought you along um, on the journey with him. You got bought into his beliefs, his, his way of playing football. And that's um, ultimately how we ended up doing such a good job at, at Mansfield and through the youth team and through to the first team. We'll come on more to like your debut and things like that and, and you breaking through in a minute. But do you think that was integral to Mansfield's success uh, under him? Because, you know, Obviously, when Billy left, um, Stuart took over, Skip took over, and he basically had the youth team, which he'd nurtured and developed and coached over three or four years as his first team. Is that what was integral to his success? Yeah, and I think, you know, you look long-term in terms of when you're, when you're in the academies and the, the youth teams, you're looking, right, these players, two, three years' time, I'm going to add to it, you know, I'm going to build on this team because they've got real potential, and I think... At the time, the first team players saw it as well. They saw that there's this group of young lads coming through who could potentially do great things. And many of them have gone on to play championship, some premiership. So, you know, the proof's in the pudding about where these players have actually gone on in terms of their footballing career. And a lot of that is down to skip. Not just about, you know, the, the footballing values that he taught everybody, but, you know, more as a person because, you know, when you're growing up as a 17, 18 year old, you look to people for guidance, you look to people for kind of your structure. And Skip gave that in terms of um, that leadership and, and him guiding you as a, almost like a father figure, really. And a lot of players did look up to him as a father figure, you know, like Liam, you know, Leroy. They kind of saw him as a person who can, they can rely on and they can feel secure with. So I think that was a, a massive part of his success and, you know, the football element kind of self. You've got a bunch of players like that who can go out and deliver on, on a weekly basis. But again, he brought them through, him and Billy, you know, in terms of a gradual phase. It wasn't right, there you go. Um, it was a, a gradual thing and it, they brought, him, it brought them in at the at the right time and it all seemed to click in, in that, that one season, really. Yeah, you know, you, you mentioned that, that, that gradual progression as well. Uh, give us your journey then uh, in, in terms of how you broke onto that, that first team scene because certainly by the time that I'd started watching sort of, um, you know, 01, 02, um, the, promotions, the promotion season, uh, you were sort of, you know, playing pretty much regularly um, and uh, it was the same for, for Nathan as well. But talk to us about your, your breakthrough. When did that happen for you and how did that come about? So um, that first season as a professional footballer, was, I think it was the season before we got, we got promoted. Um, and I really, 
I knew that I kind of had to get used to playing football every day for a living because I'd been at school, you know, in the sixth form. I'd done my A levels, so I was like a, a big fish in a small pond. And all of a sudden, you come into professional football, and you're all, already, you know, you're the smallest fish in a very big pond. And I think that took me a time to get used to the physical element of training every day. You, you, the the the, the rigmarole your body goes through, uh, the mental side of things. Um, so it took me a year, and I didn't I didn't play in that first year. In fact, I can remember all the lads going up to Scotland for a pre-season tour of I think it's like Elgin, Elgin City, and like Jerv got involved, Liam got involved, Leroy was selected for that trip, and I wasn't. I was kind of really disappointed because we were like almost peers, but I just felt to myself, you know, I, I can remember kind of speaking skip about it. I said, look, just you've got to bide your time, and luckily. Him and Billy were really good in terms of after six months they offered me a two-year contract, which was great of them. Bear in mind, hadn't even played in the first team. I mean, it was only the following season where it really came came together, really. Um, and you know, I played most of the pre-season going into the kind of promotion season. I started the first ten games, um, did okay, um, scored on. Uh, I think it was my second or third game. No, it might have been my debut against Knox County and like Worthington Cup. Uh, an evening game, scored in that, and I scored against Macclesfield. So I scored a couple, played 10 games, and then I was out of the team for a long time. And it wasn't until after Christmas, really, that I got back into it. And that's when the kind of running and the momentum came into the into the lead-up. And, yeah, it was just a, a gradual journey, uh, but I think it needed to be, because if I'd have gone in straight away, I'd have probably ended up down the road at Hucknall Town or Worksop Town, you know, without even having the, the taste of... Um, of league football and you never know at that time they might have paid more than what Mansfield did considering the, 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 probably the, did. the vast cap to be fair um, in terms of like your debut can you remember who it was against and, and sort of was it is it like a a, a late sub um, your debut um, it was actually I say I didn't play much in that first season it was actually against South End um, I don't know if you remember but um, unfortunately the league fixed of a referee um the heart attack um so there was a there was a rearranged game like literally when all the other teams had kind of uh, finished for their season we had to go down to south end to play a, another league fixture you know it, it there was no, nothing riding on it or anything like that and i, and I can remember i came on at, at south end away at roots hall um and again yeah I don't think I slept much for the night, that night. I don't think I did any time I played, you know, um, particularly evening games. I could not get sleep after evening games because your adrenaline's rushing. But, yeah, um, it's South End away um, in that, uh, it must have been 2001 season. Um, and then the next kind of, my full debut was, I think it was a Notts County game in the Worthington Cup on that Tuesday. Um, I think we beat them 3-2. It was two keepers made, I think, Pilks, um, chuck one in but then their keeper I can't remember his name now but he chuck one in as well like tried to play out from the back and I intercepted it and then just drilled it in so that was my first goal so yeah got got, got the memories got a few YouTube videos but yeah yeah um, I actually saw one the other day I can't I try, desperately trying to remember who it was against now um, I think it might have been I want to say Bradford about it. I'm, I think I'm I'm wrong but because uh, last year during lockdown, Stag shared loads of like videos and stuff. They did like goal of the day and stuff like that, and it was one of them. I think it was a uh, a one nil win. You scored the only goal sort of late on. We got absolutely peppered. Um, it was under Keith Curl. I don't remember that much. Barnsley, that's it. Yeah, I knew yeah, it with the B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah my mates. I always play on that on YouTube because that's probably the best goal I've scored, to be honest. Um, and yeah, I was getting I don't know. The, the one against the, the one when we went up, the one we when we scored pro, when we got promotion. Uh, you and Wayne Corden that day both scored relatively good goals. I seem to remember. Well, mine was a bit of a shanking top goal. I was, right? was going to say that. I was like, yeah, you know, it did go in the top bin, but it wasn't intentional, was it? Or <laughs> no, you it, claim was, it. It, it, it claimed it. Strike. It was a great strike, but to be honest, if it, if it hit it clean, I think it would. Yeah. Be so I'm glad I shanked it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so are we. Um, I remember and... that moment so much. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, we might as well talk about that moment. It seems it's, it's on the, you know, the, the cusp of our thing. I mean, Nathan's been a Stags fan since, you know, he was, you know, really, really young. I didn't really start going until I was probably an early teenager, maybe even younger than that, maybe 10, 11. Um, I went because I used to get bullied at school a lot. I used to hate football. But for some reason, going to Mansfield, I, I just seemed to in, to really enjoy it. I didn't know what was what was happening, but I, that's the first real footballing memory I've got. 
um, is, is that. There's, there's two memories. It's that game, and then there's another one where, same season, where Pilks had, had an absolute stormer. Because I just remember somebody saying to me, um, you know, what what player is your favourite player? So I think they were like going to try and get me a shirt or something. And I, I said Pilks because he, he was just in action all the time. And for years after that, I've got slated. I, I don't know why, but um, I'm sure that... Um, there's that and then there's the, the you know the promotion winning game i just remember field mill being absolutely jam packed um and i didn't really understand what was going off but so obviously over the years you know i know it sort of went down to that final game of the season which sort of stumbled a little bit i think more of it came back when 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 skip was telling the story a couple of years ago actually and you know there was a lot of tension there and i remember a lot riding on it but i just remember it being this absolutely phenomenal atmosphere and I didn't feel an atmosphere like that until probably years later when we actually went up from the conference, to be fair. And I just remember just thinking, wow, this is awesome. And then Wayne Corden's goal. I mean, you know, you've sort of admitted you shanked yours into the top corner, but it went in, so it counts. But Wayne Corden's goal, that was the first goal that I can really properly remember. And oh, it was just a ridiculous strike. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't even remember working on that in training, to be honest, but it was quite a well-worked corner. I can remember it kind of clipped it in, and then somebody, because Chrissy Greenacre nodded it down, and then um, Cords was, yeah, banded in top corner for about 25 yards. But, you know, Cords is Cords. I don't think he's ever scored a bad goal. So, uh, yeah, it was very timely. But I think in terms of the atmosphere, yeah, it was good against Chel- um, Carlisle on that, on that Saturday, but the best one was the Cheltenham game. Uh, when there was a lot riding on that, I think Cheltenham and us were kind of neck and neck for promotion. I think they were actually favourites to mm. go to for promotion uh, at that stage because I think they were like a point ahead with the game in hand. Um, and um, yeah, it was like literally, there must have been twelve thousand people at Field Mill that night. It only held eight, so there were people um, stood up around the corner flags. There was having the stewards had to get like literally a rope out. It was like the old day, like the magic 70s. tape. The, yeah, like the 70s in terms of people, the, the kickoff was delayed because there was that many people piling in. That was the best atmosphere um, that I played in at Mansfield, certainly, the, 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 the Cheltenham game. And, uh, yeah, luckily popped up and scored the winner as well for that one. Um, and then we, um, I think uh, Cheltenham had a game at Carlisle on the Tuesday night. And if they won, they'd have got promoted. But I think they either lost or drew. Um, and then that's when it took to the last game of the season where... Cheltenham had to um, beat Plymouth, who'd already got promoted down at Home Park, and we had to beat Carlisle. So ours was a bit of a bit of an easier task than, than Cheltenham's. I think they lost, and we were getting updates all the time through the game. I can remember the fans going up and down, and like as soon as we scored the second goal, really, I, I kind of relaxed and I knew that you know it was a bit of a part. The second half was a bit of a kind of uh, a friendly, if you like, because um, we knew that it was almost there. I just felt after that second goal that. That we'd done it, and and all obviously all the noises from the crowds were saying, yeah, Charlton are losing, uh, you know, Plymouth are now two 0 three 0 up. So it was just a um, yeah, a great a great game, a great occasion to be involved in, really. Now I would have to watch it back, Nath, um because it's been you know three years since we recorded. Ironically, three years today actually since we recorded it um, with Stuart Watkins. But I remember him saying, I don't know if you can remember this, Nath, that he knew before a ball had been kicked that day that we'd got promoted. Can you remember that? I can remember saying something along those lines, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether it was belief um, or no, just I, one I of those can remember what it was. feelings, was it? I, I can remember what it was. I can't remember names and I can't remember exact teams, but I think it was uh, Cheltenham, wasn't it, who we were going head-to-head with. They dropped. They, it was them or us for the last day. Whoever was Cheltenham manager, the manager of the opposition team who they played on the last day of the season rang Stuart Watkiss during the week or on the Friday um, and said, don't worry about promotion tomorrow, just go and play your game because I'm telling you now, we will beat them. And he just Ooh. went, he just went, why? And he just, the manager who, I can't remember for the life of me who Cheltenham played on that last game of the season, but he just Plymouth. took Plymouth. It would have been, yeah. yeah. been Paul Sturrock at Plymouth who he would, he would have had a conversation with, I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, because that was a danger for us because Plymouth, had nothing to play for. They'd already been promoted. They were champions. So for them, yeah. they could have took foot off the gas and had a proper, you know, um, just a, a, a really kind of chilled out game, really, you know. But 
luckily they they went for it and they beat him. Yeah, and, and that is, do you know what that is actually rung a bell in my head because I remember he him said that he, Stuart Watkins said that Paul Sturrock said to him, "We will beat them because their manager, I absolutely fucking hate him." And and <laughs> and that was it. And he just went, "I will beat, uh, we will beat him because I absolutely hate him." And he just sort of he said after that phone call, he'd had the best night's sleep that he'd ever had. Mm-hmm. It was. It was it was good. I seem to remember, you know, we were talking about the corner routine. I seem to remember him, Nate. I don't know whether he, he said that he did work on that or whether it was, you know, some. I think he'd. No, I think he actually said you worked on something about putting it towards the far post and it ended up being dinked in towards the near and you scored like practically two goals from it or whatever. And Yeah, yeah, you know, it just, was two corners, wasn't it? Yeah. The goal, yeah. Yeah. I remember there was um there were there were signals, wasn't it? Was it two art two hands up at the or was it one I can't remember now. There, there was a signal from the obviously the corner corner taker, which, which obviously was, it, yeah. was something that was worked on. And it was I remember I was reading the uh, the match report earlier and it said in there that up to that point we'd been awful at corners all season. So it was um you know, so ironic that we ended up getting promotion from from, from, from basically two of them. Mm. Just shows you those finer details of that planning, you know, just going is the fine line, isn't it, between success and failure. So, um, yeah, we, well, Stuart, obviously, Skip obviously did uh, did his bit during the week and it paid off for the, for the game on the Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. And we thank Paul Sturrock for that phone call as well, because I can imagine, you know, we, we spent, what, an hour and a half, maybe two hours in, in Stuart Watkins' company. We could have spent all day with him, to be fair, but you got that feeling he was a... a a lovable but an intense manager that would literally worry about every little fine detail and really took the club to heart. And, you know, he still follows the club now, which is great, and still has, you know, really good words of advice and everything. He, you know, we'd welcome him back whenever he's back in the country to come and watch a game with us. And you always felt that because he'd sort of brought those players through, he'd picked up the mantle, results had sort of gone off the wane a little bit. He said that he wanted to deliver for, for Mansfield Town. And I genuinely feel that had he not had that phone call from Paul Storick to you know, put his mind at ease and maybe a little bit, that it, it might have been a little bit too much. It's those little bits of reassurance which you know, really do clear the mind and you know, give you that, that, that momentum to, to go into a game and to play with, without the pressure. Yeah, well, to be fair, Skip used to live and breathe it. He literally used to sleep in, in the office at, at Field Mill. Um, Monday to Friday, he never went home um, because he lived and breathed football. I can imagine his kind of head thinking about all the different scenarios, the different team tactics, the kind of um, the personal conversations he might have to have with players going over it. I mean, as a manager, you used to have so much going on in your brain. It must be so difficult to switch off, but Skip never did switch off. He was literally, football was his life. Um, and at the end of the day, it, you know, it paid off in terms of Mansfield getting promoted, so he put his life and soul into that team and again promotion. Let's talk managers, uh, two in particular other than Stuart Watkins. The first one is Billy Dearden, who we mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, fantastic character. I'd love to find find some form of way of uh, getting in touch with him, getting on, getting him on. Two spells at the club, fantastic manager. Um, but in that season, did leave a bit of a, a bitter taste when he went to, uh, left the club for, for Notts County. Um, what was that like as a player at that time? Because obviously, you know, you, you were a relatively young bunch that had come through with Skip. He was the assistant manager. We were all starting to get your breakthroughs. You've got Billy Dearden, who you spoke so positively about earlier on. What was that like when uh, he decided to uh, to move on? Did you know? It's a bit of- um, no, I didn't know. Um, I can remember we played um, Leicester in the FA Cup. Uh, I think it was like third round at Filbert Street. Uh, and that was Billy's last game. Uh, I think he did tell us before the game that it was leaving after. Um, but, yeah. And we went to Portugal the day after for a, a four-day trip in um, Villamora. Uh, I say Bender, but it was a pre- it was like a mid-season break, I'd say. Uh, but we had a good time. We just got away from it all, you know, all the kind of media tension and all that yeah. um but i think i don't know it might it might have been a kind of selfless act from billy in terms of knowing stewart's time is now and almost saying there you go Stuart, you know take take us home kind of thing do you know what i mean in terms of that so we always it was no no different for us because we knew that skip would actually you know take take the management and um, he knows all the players he took all the training sessions Billy was very good in terms of that kind of man management, but um, it was Stuart kind of helping drive the team forward, if you like. So it was literally 
nothing nothing really changed for us um in fact remember uh skip we used to set out all the cones for like running because skips massively into his running they used to like keep us really fit and do these kind of long uh, running sessions and um, he used to set these cones up at ashfield school and i can remember skip putting the cones out billy did and following him kicking him in saying i'm not in my place running that far and all <laughs> this so it was a uh, bit they made a great a great team really in terms of billy and that knowledge and awareness of the game itself and and skip with the kind of um newfound coaching techniques and um fitness challenges let's let's call them <laughs> yeah absolutely let's move to another manager because you of course mentioned uh there um you know Stuart Watkiss and uh, and things like that and I guess that's um that was the bigger blow when when he um you know got the sack you got promoted um you know it was difficult the following season um he brought in a few uh, other players and, and, and things like that and was starting to sort of find the feet but unfortunately he was you know shown the door and moved on and Keith Curl brought in was it more of a blow with um, uh, with Stuart Watkins leaving because of the journey that you'd all been on together especially you know that that core group of you, you know yourself Liam Leroy Bobby and, and all the, the all, all the other names in there as well 100% because at the end of the day you know although we did have ups and downs in kind of league one or the second division or whatever it was back then we were doing all right you know we started really well at plymouth at home um that was the only time i've been top top scorer in the league for about <laughs> half a day i scored two on my opening game of the season against plymouth um then we had a really good run so i mean we're scoring for fun i can remember the, the game against bristol bristol city when i think we would lose five four or draw mm. four all so Getting goals was no problem. Um, it was actually keeping them out the other end. And I, I firmly believe we would have stayed in that league if, if Skip would have um, continued. Because although he, he he had a few challenges in those early days of that season, he would he would have got it right. He would have put it right. But again, the chairman at the time didn't didn't have any patience. I think he probably uh, big mates would keep killed down the pub. Um, you know, so I think he he always had half an eye on bringing Keith Curl in because he was coming towards the end of his playing days. So um, I think he, he, he finished off at Barnsley playing, and then all of a sudden he he came training down at uh, down at Stags uh, with the view to being a player, but then half an eye on actually he's going to be kind of taking over the reins here in the end. So let me just clarify this. Um, you say he came in and sort of as a player because obviously he did. You know, play for us um, when he was manager. Was player manager for a little bit. Was he training uh, whilst Skip was still the gaffer? Yeah, yeah. I can remember we played. Uh, we used to train at West Knox College, and I can remember turning up in his big fancy Mercedes. Um, and I was in awe really because he was a Premier League, you know, star really from yeah. when I was growing up. I think, oh, blimey, Keith Curl. And I'm not joking as a player as well. He still had it. He, he was still, you know, rapid, um, straight off the mark really solid defender and it would have made a good signing uh, but I think the chairman had half an eye on him actually taking over as a as a kind of player manager and he did like you say he did he did do both roles for a, a, a period during that season and to be fair he did tighten up the ship at the back it, it did it did work unfortunately um, we did end up getting relegated that season that's very snaky though that Nathan isn't it because if you're Skip you're looking across at him training you're thinking I've not really made the, the phone call to, to bring him in. He's, you know, it's been brought in over my head. I know where this is going, and that must just trigger so much in your head. That's just, uh, again, I'm not surprised considering who the chairman was, but that's such a snake of a move, that. Yeah, I mean, actually, I, I can't remember Curl playing, to be fair. So um, I'm trying to rack my brains a little bit. But, um, yeah, I think from sort of Stuart Watkins' point of view um you know you'd like to have thought he would have been given more time anyway the fact that you know that we mm. just got promoted you're in a high division you're expected to you know to maybe find it more challenging so it probably felt a little bit of pressure anyway the fact that you know, this, this, they've taken a step up and you obviously the objective is to, to survive and, and try and build on that but then to for something like that to maybe come up and you know, to, to happen with a player coming in where yeah, it's hard to say because we wasn't there, but we're how how aware of the situation you know Watkins may have been at that point, like I say, probably was in the back of his head anyway. So um, having to deal with that on top of uh, you know trying to 
stabilise uh, the team as well, which has just been promoted. Um, you know, it wasn't going to help situation, was it? Yeah, it's absolutely. It's such a sneaky move. And again, it, it's something which doesn't surprise me whatsoever. Um, let's touch upon his time as manager under him, because obviously that sort of started uh, the end for you at Mansfield. But before you did... Um, sort of before you did move on, uh, you did play uh, a really big part in a huge, huge game in Mansfield Town history. The 18th of January 2003. Can you remember the game? No. Chesterfield away. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Chesterfield yeah. away. Um, I, can't, I, I can remember it being quite sunny. That's why I think in January. Yeah, yeah. But it, was, it was quite a nice January day, wasn't it? Yeah. But, yeah, it's a no, beautiful I, day, <laughs> and I, can, I, I always enjoy it when the uh, when when they pop pop up on uh, on social media or, or, or whatever, and um, yeah, just me kind of lolloping about in the in the opposition area when uh, Liam pops up in last minute to to score that header. Oh, what a f- absolutely ridiculous day! What was that like to play? And I mean, for me, 18th of January is my birthday, and I've never been so furious um, at, like my parents because. Um, my dad had booked me like a, a birthday party bowling, so I couldn't go to the game. But I was listening listening to it on the radio. wasn't allowed to go to the game, obviously with it being away in a local derby and being young and it's ridiculous, really. But I just remember hearing it on the radio and thinking that must be great. Then I experienced it, you know, later as a fan and um, you, with numerous performances at Chesterfield and everything. It's such a different atmosphere. But what's that like to, to play in? Because you must, as a player and as a local lad, know the importance, especially with you know the likes of Liam and, and Diz in there, who are also local lads as well. You guys must know the importance of that game. Yeah, I mean, there's such an intense rivalry there, in the, you know, whether it's through the kind of the, the, the pit days and that kind of intensity that that brought about in terms of the strike and all that. So that adds a, an extra kind of element of ferocity. Um, and also, you know, the occasion in terms of like the geographical distance between the, the two clubs, uh, the fact that Chesterfield were always kind of yo-yoing up and down the leaves and we never really got to play each other that often. Um, and also the kind of the history behind Saltergate as well, and the the ground. It's got such such a great kind of history and tradition, and it's a great old ground. You know, eighty mm. percent of them are standing, so that adds an extra layer of kind of intensity and atmosphere. Um, so it was just a, it, it was a pleasure to play. I mean, I used to go. I didn't go and watch Chesterfield. I like when I was at a spare spare. spare I used to play at Chesterfield as a young kid, kind of fifteen, sixteen year old schoolboy. Uh, so I used to go and like be ball boy and stuff like that, and always kind of watching Tony Lorber actually at the time, and uh, thinking, God, if I ever get to play on that pitch, and I did get to play on that pitch, and it was against Chesterfield, and luckily we came away um, winners. Uh, but yeah, it was a great day and uh, an even better night. Yeah, I can imagine. Any stories from that night? That you I mean? It's twenty odd years on now. I mean, they're they're all most of them are all not playing now or not involved with football. So there must be a couple of stories you can chuck out from, from that night. Well, I think it was an early kickoff. It was, I think yeah. It was like eleven o'clock kickoff, yeah. yeah. So by three o'clock, we were down Mansfield, and yeah, it got it got a little bit messy. Although I think um, I went up Leeds actually. All, all the lads were around, around um, Chesterfield, uh, around Mansfield, really kind of you know getting into it. Three, four o'clock, beers were flowing. I mean, I caught a, a taxi up to up to Leeds because it was one of my mates' birthdays. So yeah, I think um, it. it it, it was a messy night. Let's just let's just say that. But I mean, after the promotion, talk about nights out. The promotion night um, after we got promoted against um, uh, Carlisle, that was the the best night of my life. It was brilliant. You know, like the whole town was buzzing. Everyone was like high fiving you and buying you drinks. And you know, I, I went to remember. I walked into the Pally. I don't remember the Pally nightclub. Yeah. And the whole. Oh no, I could just went silence and started chanting, Andy, why, why, why? <laughs> Honestly, I'll take you back to my grave, which is a whole night of chanting. Uh, but yeah, with, uh, I mean, Mansfield was a good night anyway, but when when you kind of, you offer back back a decent result, the whole the whole town get, gets kind of real uplift because end of the day, it's what people live for. They live for going to the football on a Saturday and they live for the uh, enjoyment of a, of a good result on a Saturday night. So you want to enjoy that, you want to join in with them and be a part of that. And they, they did make you feel kind of part of the club and part of the community, really, when you did um, venture out into the, uh, the depths of Mansfield. 
I mean, you the only thing you were missing uh, is a goal against Chesterfield because, you know, you're a promotion winner. You've played in a Derby Day win over them. You know, you were getting drinks brought for your left, right and centre. Had you scored, it wouldn't have been Andy White, White, White. It would have been Sir Andy White, White, White. You get an honorary <laughs> knighthood when you... Uh, when you score against Chesterfield. So uh, there is one thing, particular thing about that game, though, which I want to sort of uh, touch upon, and that's an ex-teammate of yours who switched allegiances, a certain Mr. Bradley, and a certain mm. incident after he came off the bench uh, and then soon was having an early bath, 90 seconds after coming on, between him and Reese Day. Were you on the pitch at that point? Yes, yes, that was one of the very few games I actually played 90 minutes, actually, because I remember it was... Um... It was two young. It was Beardo, Chris Beardsley, and uh, Craig Mitchell. Actually, were kind of we, we were all there and thereabouts mm. in terms of a team. And I think um, me and Beardo started up front. So it was the young lad Beardo who got the shepherd's hook and, and got subbed off. Um, I think probably only a handful of games I actually played ninety minutes, but I was on the pitch at the time that Bradders came on and did that. And you know, he uh, yeah. He, he he saw the red mist, didn't he, and uh, did something a little bit silly. So uh, yeah. Do you think Reese did do anything? I mean, knowing Reese and knowing centre halves in general, they're always at it. Uh, anyone, I mean, you play play now on non-league, they're always in your ear. They're always trying to get one over on you. So uh, it doesn't surprise me one bit. That's part of the game. At the end of the day, you're trying to get one over your your kind of opposition, aren't you? And you do that by any legal means met, uh, necessary. And if that means giving them a bit, giving them a bit of banter, and if they can't handle it, then that's up to them. They'll see they'll see red, which is what happened. Absolutely, and that from an ex-policeman who never actually arrested anybody. There you go. <laughs> um, of yeah. course, another thing about that as well, you know, it, it's such a good thing. Do you think it made it more so because, you know, it, it was a Mansfield player, you know, only a couple of seasons before and switched allegiances. Do you think that's what made it a little bit uh, more sort of, it, it just sort of put the ice on the cake with that incident? You, if it was going to happen to anybody that game it was going to happen to him yeah and, and I mean I think when Bradders came in there was a lot of because they paid a lot of money for, for Bradders when 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 I think they bought him for about 150 grand from Southampton uh, the previous season so there was a lot riding on it financially in terms of making that kind of commitment to um, a player who's from a Premier League team and I think it didn't really take off for Bradders for one reason or another you know I know he did suffer a lot through injury and stuff um, and then, you know, moving over to the local rivals probably didn't help. Mm. So, yeah, it was just that kind of perfect combination, really, that um, then saw what 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 happened next. So, yeah. Last little bit on Chesterfield. Obviously, Liam Lawrence's glorious winner late on. First of all, how much do you wish that it was you that, that you know, that, that got the, the header in, into, the, into the goal in front of the, the hordes of travelling Stags fans? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't the strongest in the year, so I probably would have missed it anyway. So I'm glad it was someone who I could actually head a ball and uh, it ended up in the right place rather than uh, in the middle of the fans behind the goal. But yeah, now, I mean, you're, you're just pleased that you, you won at the end of the day. You're not bothered who scores. You just want to you wanna, you wanna win. Uh, and uh, yeah, luckily, Liam popped up in the uh, right place, right time. What was going through your head when, you know, when he pulled away the iconic celebration shirt off that was the, the go-to celebration back then anyway wheeled it round his head in front of the stags fans brilliant brilliant scenes uh, what you know what was going through your head at that point were you thinking you know we've, we've won a game of football were you thinking you know it's a little bit bigger this might help us on the journey to stay up what emotions and thoughts were going through your head at that time to be honest i was panicking because um my girlfriend who's my, now my wife was in the mix Oh, standing right. up behind the goal. Yeah, and the re the re the, re the reason I was panicking was because you you had the option to pay for a for a seated ticket, but it was an extra pound. So because it was cheaper, I got a standing <laughs> ticket. So I was I was going on my day. She's this... going to be like on her own as well. She didn't have any family. With no, her. She, she was in a, in amongst all that, like stood oh, up. God, I don't know what she must have made there, but yeah, for oh, me, I wow. was uh, yeah panicking. Yeah, I can imagine. And this, you know. I, I'd have thought you'd have been a little bit more coy with the money after those early days. You know, well, you, you got, earning from Hucknall, earning from Stags, the highest paid player in the youth team. I thought you'd have gone a few away and you wouldn't pay an extra pound. Quid's, quid's a quid, isn't it? In the day. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> it's saved to get in splinters. So, you that know, is true. Yeah. yeah. You're going to save a pound. You're going to save a pound. That is very, very true. <laughs> Let's move on uh, finally to, you know, the end of your Mansfield Town journey. How involved was Keith Curl uh, in that? Um, 
to be fair, when Keith Cole came in, he was he was having me. You know, I'd I'd been on Skip sent me on loan to Crew. Um, bear in mind, Crew were in the same league, and I think Crew had hammered us like five nil, four nil. I think we played him in the cup. Mm. Five nil, four nil, three nil. Because we played played them three times that season. But Dario Grady saw something in me, um, and he he'd approached Skip and said, "Look, I want to take him on loan uh, in the same league. Crew were doing slightly better, so." fair play to skip he let me go out on loan really um and just to better my kind of football development um and then keith curl came in and he pulled me back off loan from from crew and towards the end of that running he was you know i was in the team i can remember playing against blackpool scoring boxing day um i got injured on on boxing day but then he put me straight back in the team so throughout the rest of that that team he was he i was i was in his plans it was just through that summer um he offered me a, a, a new contract for the following season and it wasn't on great great terms it was like an incentivized based contract um on not on very good money at all bear in mind i'd done okay you know yeah. scored like 10 11 goals that season i was expecting a bit more um so i went on on trial um at bristol rovers because when you're out of contract you can go and kind of mm. seek other op- options didn't want to go but i was kind of pressured into it from kind of external forces to go down to bristol rovers hated it in a hotel you know i like being at home i like to be around kind of my family and stuff um didn't really want to go and then when i came back um the contract was still on the table i wanted to sign it. i did it all along but i signed it and then i think it must have been a bit of a kind of knock to his ego really that yeah. i've gone somewhere else to try and find more money if you like but end of the day you need to look after yourself you need to look after your family at the it end of the day a quid is a quid a, a real Oh yeah, yeah, quid, <laughs> quid. It, it was a it was a real derisory offer based on the fact yeah. that I'd, I'd done done so well. So I was a bit disappointed. Then when I came back, I can remember we played uh, late in Orient on that first game of the season. They started me, um, did all right, and then after he phoned me up and said, "Oh, uh, Andy, I'm sending you out on loan to Boston United." I'm like, "Where?" Uh, ended up going on loan to Boston United. Then I came back um, and he sent me on loan to Kidderminster Harriers for three months enjoyed it down at Kidderminster, loved it under Jan Mulvey, learnt a lot mm. from there. Then I came back and then that's when Burton came in for me again. So it was really like a stop-start season yeah. for me in terms of being out on loan. And that's really when I fell out of love with football. But then Crew came back in for me, um, like the April, March-April time, towards the end of that season. And bear in mind, he'd sent me off to Boston United, Burton, um, Kidderminster... And then he turned crew down. The crew were in the championship at the time. I can remember we should have travelled down to Yeovil for Mansfield and crew were playing at Forest. Mm. And he wanted me to take me and, and start me against Forest in the championship. And and, and Keith Kill turned it down. So that for me was like the beginning of the end. And then he took me to Wales, you know, the Millennium Stadium for the playoff final, spare man there. And he brought somebody in from, from Chef United to, you know, be that striker, that, that kind of target man i can't remember his name now but he kind of played in front of me and so yeah my head completely went after that um and it was just a case of getting that final game at millennium stadium out of the way really in the playoffs as well i was traveling to northampton in the semis and seeing the lads doing really well and you couldn't really feel happy for them because you weren't part of that really so it was a real bittersweet end for me at, at mansfield yeah absolutely i can imagine and that's that's such a tough thing, isn't it, of a footballer? And like you say, maybe, maybe you did hit the nail on the head. Maybe it was the ego thing because you didn't take the deal when it it was first there. Because you know you've got to protect your family and everything. And I, sure. I, I think that's you know that's that's the thing which a lot of fans don't don't think about. And I think that's a, a real real shame. If you could uh, if you could sort of uh, go back and sort of maybe playing one Mansfield game, relive one Mansfield game as a footballer again, which game would you would you pick from your time at the club? Definitely that Cheltenham game on that Tuesday night. Um, that was just an immense atmosphere. So much riding on it. Uh, and luckily I popped up and, and got the winner. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the Cheltenham game for me was, was the bigger of the two. Like I say, I'm a Carlisle. Yeah, I scored. Yeah. And it was a real celebration day. But the job was done, really, for me. And like Skip said, you know, he felt confident going into that game, so it wasn't as much pressure. So that was more like a, a celebration game, really, for promotion, a, a bit of a party game, whereas the Cheltenham game was a real kind of... Um, that was a, the bread and butter. That was where it was won in the end, really, for me. 
I guess that's a bit like um, for, for our younger listeners and or for ourselves as well, Craig. It's a bit like um, you look at our conference winning days. Um, yeah. Hereford was the more emotive game, wasn't it? Yeah. More so maybe than the Wrexham game, in which you know because that that getting that win that was a point where you really sort of re- realised that you might have secured promotion. So I guess that's the same as uh, you know Cheltenham before Carl- Carlisle. Back then. There's also definitely something in that idea of getting the lads back together. You get get on the blower to Mez and, uh, and and we will get it sorted out. I think a Mansfield Matters uh, 20 year reunion. It would be great to see that again. Andy, we really appreciate yeah. your time tonight. Before we let you shoot off, though, there is one little bit of uh, content we're going to get you involved in. Every single person who comes on uh, Stag Stories does this, including your ex gaffer Stuart Watkiss, uh, and probably a couple of your t- ex teammates as well. Bobby Hassel, we've had on before. Maybe Mick Bolden, you might have uh, crossed paths with. Oh, yeah, I know. Well. Yeah, uh, Mick, Mick Bolden is the nicest bloke in football. It's Biggest house so... in Sheffield as well. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> everyone says that ridiculous. Uh, it's basically it's called the oh, it's all about you quiz. Uh, Ten questions against the clock about your time at the Stags. To be fair, most of which we will have touched upon over the last half an hour, forty five minutes or so. So hopefully they'll be sort of fresh in your mind. Um, this is how it works. Ten questions against the clock. Uh, contestants are looking to get the most correct answers in the quickest time. If you get an answer wrong, it's plus five seconds to your total time. If you pass, it's plus ten. So it's worth a go, even if you don't know uh, the leaderboard as 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 follows at the minute uh, Stuart Watkiss uh, is mid table at the moment with 6 in uh, 142 uh, Bobby Hassel just beneath in 6 in 149 uh, Mick Bolding did quite well actually he did 8 uh, in 138 I think he's 4th in the leaderboard uh, at the moment as well Ian Bowling, who was the very first guest on our Stags stories as well he's in there as well with uh, 7 in 139 so what would you be sort of aiming with who are you looking to beat out of those uh, X names I'll, I'll be honest one I'm hopeless at quizzes <laughs> two I'm not great under pressure, hence the reason I failed at being a firefighter. But, yeah. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not holding out much hope. I'd, uh, I'll I'm, take bottom, to be honest. But. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say uh, that you know this is nowhere near as intense as uh, firefighting training, but you never know. I mean, people do get weirdly competitive uh, with this. Uh, Nath, what's your advice uh, for Andy as we uh, prepare for this one? Um, probably pre- prepare yourself for, for an anagram. Craig loves them. I hate them. Um, well, yeah, it's as, as definitely said, one in there. Yeah, it's definitely. It's always one better to, uh, to 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 take a shot at a guess than than to pass. So um, yeah, that, that's my advice. Absolutely. Uh, the time will start after I've asked the first question. You were talking about uh, settling for bottom. Well, the score to beat uh, is five. Uh, the, uh, the bottom score at the moment is Paul Cox's first attempt. We've had him on twice. Um, Five in twen- uh, two minutes twenty four. So anything above that, I think that's a, a very good score. I mean, I did stitch him up a little bit and uh, on that. I, th- I think you'll do quite well with this. The lot of the stuff which we've spoken about um, today will come into that, and there's a lot of guesswork in there as well. So, Andy, are you ready to ready to play the It's All About You quiz? Yeah. Okay. Uh, your time will start after I've asked the first question. Uh, in three, two, one. You began to break onto the first team scene from the bench during the, the 2000-2001 campaign, but where did the Stags finish that season? Third, 13th or 23rd? 13th. Against which team did you make your debut? South End. The following season, 0102, you got off the mark, netting in a 4-0 win over who? Macclesfield. Arguably your most important goal came at the end of the Stags season when they went up on the final day of the season beating Carlisle, but who else found the net that day? Wayne Corden. Manager Bill Dearden departed midway through the season, joining which of the Stags' local rivals? Notts County. During the 02-03 season in what is now League One, how many goals did you get in all competitions? Six. Either look. Either look is an anagram of which of your former managers? Either look. Keith Kill. You played a big part in the Stag's dramatic Derby Day win over the Seaward in January 03, but which of your former teammates was sent off? Jane Bradley. You were loaned out to four clubs during your time with the Stags. Name one of them. Boston United. And finally, you progressed through at the same time as Bobby Hassel, Liam Lawrence and Craig Disley, but of the three... Who of them would go on to play the most games for the Stags? Bobby Hassel. 
stop the clock. Nathan Edge, how do you think he did there? Very well. I think this is going to be very close to the top. Very close. Andy, how do it's you think? Uh, how do you think you did there? Well, I think I did alright actually. Yeah, weren't too many that, that caught me out. Even the anagram I kind of got. I think. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that was that was quite a nice one. I mean, compared to some of the ones I've had, I'm a bit fuming to be honest. <laughs> Nathan, you're my mate. I get to stitch you up. I can't stitch guests up too often. <laughs> well, let's put you out of your misery and podcast listeners out of their misery as well. This is incredible. We have waited so many episodes for this moment. We finally have a guest who has scored 10 out of 10. I'm surprising myself. I, I thought it was nine, to be honest. I thought the last one may have been wrong. I'd have gone with Craig Disley, so... Um, more, than, more than I got. So Bobby, Bobby, Bobby went to, got in the team really early um, yeah. in terms of, um, I think it was like 17 or something. So Bobby played loads of games. It's very tight between the three. Uh, Liam Lawrence, 136. Craig Disley, 141. Uh, and then Bobby Hassel, 164 um, in yeah. the end. Um, Time-wise, it's almost irrelevant because... You know, we've waited so long for somebody to get high scores. I mean, eight or seven was your average. Um, two players on nine. Um, but to get ten in one minute 14 was an exceptionally quick score <laughs> as well. So maybe, yeah, you know, yeah. maybe this is the start of something new for you, Andy. Maybe quizzes are, uh, you know, your forte. Maybe this is a new career path <laughs> for you. Maybe we'll, we, you know, we'll see you on the chase in a couple of years' time. Uh, well, it, it does that when you update your own Wikipedia page, so you know all the stats. But... I mean, that is that is very true. Because oh, well, hold on a minute, Les. so these might not be actually one hundred percent accurate either. Because basically, uh, I, I mean, Andy's going to put the answers on there. Do you know what? Do you know what? There, there is one question. This might cause some controversy on there. Um, there is one question which I actually had a different answer for, but you answered uh, earlier on. We were talking about your debut. Um, you said South End. My research said Cardiff. You know what? I don't know whether that I don't know whether I got on against Southend or not. I can remember the first time I was on the bench. So it might it might it might well be Cardiff. Although it might not have counted as actual fixture because it was like an extended season. I don't know. But yeah. I mean Bit it, of a debate on that one. It's it's a very, very like uh, debatable one, isn't it? I mean, it, I should know, really, shouldn't I? I mean, should know whether I actually played. Twenty odd years ago, though, man. Twenty odd years ago. I mean, to be fair, if we're saying it wasn't um, South End, I mean, we'll have to have a judge's inquiry and have a look into it. That would give you a time of uh, nine correct in one nineteen, which would still take you to the top of the leaderboard. To be fair, so. I think I did. I think I did come on against Southend. I'm, sh I'm sure. I'm sure I did because I was on. I was on the bench um, about a season before that when I was still doing A levels against Exeter, but never got on. Mm. Um, and I can remember the South End was the kind of first time I'd been named in the kind of squad, and and Billy saying to me, "You're going to play tonight because it basically means nothing." So I've got nothing to lose. I can chuck you on, Andy. So I'm, I'm sure it was that South End game. Do you know what? I I'm going to give it you because it was. 20 odd years ago I wasn't really watching football the stags too much then um, I'm sure there'll be some people that put us right if you if you're listening to this or you're watching this and you you know the facts and you can prove the facts let us know and we'll amend the leaderboard um you know as per um but either way Andy you are top of the the leaderboard it's either 10 in 114 or 9 in 119 an incredible score and I think you'll agree Nath as well an absolutely incredible guest for us today Absolutely, yeah. Um, like we say, we, we, it's going back 20 years, so it's always uh, difficult to, to, to dig out some of the stories, I guess, when you're going back so far. But like we both mentioned, it was the start of our, um, personally, our time sort of as becoming Mansfield fans. You know, we've, we've talked about three games there that I remember very well to say I would have only been seven, uh, six and seven years old. But, uh, you know, the Cheltenham, Carlisle and that Chesterfield game, um, three very well, especially the Chesterfield game, I absolutely loved it. Um, so to, to to go back and relive some of those memories are uh, uh, you know, absolutely brilliant. And it's great to hear sort of your perspective of it as well. And, you know, we've talked about the football, but again, we've we've touched on the, 
very important parts of sort of mental health as well mm. in the game and and outside the game. So uh, no, thank you very much for for joining us, and it's no, been a bit. super insight as, as as expected. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been a you know I'm often going through these stories with my mates. You know, um, I'll be down the pub or um, over the phone or um, when we play football, we play five a side. So. It's good that I can bore other people rather than just for me. One of the things you can say now as well, you know, you say you've, you've been a police officer, didn't arrest anybody, been a fireman, <laughs> didn't, didn't play out any fires, but you, mean, you was a footballer, you got a promotion medal, and now you're top of the leaderboard at the Mansfield Matters quiz. So, you, you know, it's, the honours are there. As accolades go, I think that's probably the best. That, 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 that's almost as good there, as a man of the match tweet from me, isn't it, these days? You know, it's, it's, absolutely, it's absolutely it is. Uh, Andy, thanks very much for your time. We always end on the, the guest's final word, so this is your opportunity uh, for you to send a message to, to Stags fans, and I'm sure there'll be uh, a former manager of yours that can't resist having a little listen to this um, as well. So, uh, Andy White, it's over to you for the final word. Yeah, I mean, obviously, being a, a local-ish lad, um, growing up, wanting to be a professional footballer, dreaming of being a professional footballer, and to, to actually have fulfilled that dream is something that nobody can ever take away from me. And, you know, all the banter in the world on the yeah, football pitch on a Saturday afternoon can't take it away from me. I've got the memories, you know, creating memories for other people as well, which is nice to hear. Um, and, you know, special thanks to, to Skip, um, all the managers I've played under really for helping me to fulfil that dream. Um, it's every boy's dream to play professional football. Um, I'm lucky, one of the few that actually got to fulfil that dream. Dreamed of playing at Wembley, played in, in, in the cup final at Wembley. So for me, I kind of come away from football very content knowing that A, I did my best and B, um, created such fantastic memories. So uh, yeah, um, Mansfield will always be a special place in my heart in terms of my footballing journey um, the, the supporters were fantastic with me and um, still are when I want to work in and around Mansfield and uh, hopefully um, get to a few games uh, next season when fans are allowed back in another chance to ensure surely this game will be won and it's going to be slammed in by White And surely now this game is won. There may only be, what, 29 minutes gone here. But Carlisle with nothing to play for and having not scored for six and a half hours must now do so twice to stop Mansfield getting the three points they believe will take them into Division 2. White with the second. <laughs> 